Please open your Bible and join me in Jeremiah chapter 21 as we begin today. Last time we were together from the book of Ezekiel, we saw the start of the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem. It was on the 10th day of the 10th month of the ninth year of King Zedekiah, which uh, renders a date on our calendar toward the tail end of December of 590 B.C. So the siege has started, and as we open Jeremiah 21, the siege has started. And so now we're going to hear from a prophet who was actually in the city of Jerusalem when these things occurred. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from he who is. When King Zedekiah sent to him Pashur, the son of Malkiah, and Zephaniah, the priest, the son of Maaseah, saying, Inquire of he who is for us. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is making war against us. Perhaps he who is will deal with us according to all his wonderful deeds and will make him withdraw from us. Now, if the name Pashur sounds familiar, it's because not too long ago, he and Jeremiah had a little head-to-head. And uh, Jeremiah basically told Pashur, you're wrong, God's judgment is falling on this nation, and you are going to see a lot of your friends and family die, and then you're going to be taken off to Babylon as an exile, and that's where you're going to die. Uh, So Jeremiah has been consistently warning the Israeli people for almost four decades now that the judgment of God was coming in the form of the Babylonians. And the people's response and many of the leaders' response was to just get angry at Jeremiah or to just simply say, ah, that's nonsense. It isn't going to happen. God will take care of us. He would never let anything bad happen to his tabernacle or his temple or to his ark or his people. Well, now the siege has started. It's become real. And so King Zedekiah tells Pashur and Zephaniah to go talk to Jeremiah to basically say, you need to talk to God for us. You need to talk to God about this attack. And maybe then God will save us. And so, verse 3, Jeremiah said to them, Thus you shall say to Zedekiah. So here's the message you can take back. Thus says he who is the God of Israel. Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands and with which you are fighting against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans who are besieging you outside the walls. So God's response is basically, I'm not going to help you. In fact, I'm going to make you guys incapable of fighting. I'm going to make your stuff not work very well. So God says, I'm going to be on the side of the Babylonians because this is my judgment. Verse number four finishes. I will bring them together into the midst of the city. So they're going to take the city, guaranteed. Verse 5, I myself will fight against you with outstretched hand and strong arm, in anger and in fury and in great wrath. And I will strike down the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of a great pestilence. Now, this is not new information. God's been saying this all along. But once again, they're not listening They're actually trying to come through Jeremiah and ask for God to save them from this time of trouble. And God's response is, I am bringing the time of trouble. This is my wrath 
and people will die, guaranteed. Verse 7, Afterward, declares he who is, I will give Zedekiah king of Judah and his servants and the people of this city who survived the pestilence, sword, and famine into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, into the hand of their enemies, into the hand of those who seek their lives. He shall strike them down with the edge of the sword. He shall not pity them or spare them or have compassion. Now, Zedekiah is not going to die, but many of his companions, many of his advisors, many of his uh, royal companions are going to die. And God is telling them that ahead of time. And lest you feel too much pity, you need to remember that they have been given many, many, many chances of repentance. As I already said, Jeremiah has been the prophet of repentance for almost 40 years now, and they've blown him off. Verse 8, To this people you shall say, Thus says he who is, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. He who stays in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence, But he who goes out and surrenders to the Chaldeans who are besieging you shall live and shall have his life as a prize of war. For I have set my face against this city for harm and not for good, declares he who is. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon and he shall burn it with fire. That's pretty plain, isn't it? God's very strong recommendation is you need to surrender. Because all that's left for the people that try to stay in Jerusalem is death by tons of different ways, either in war or by disease or by lack of food. Verse number 11. To the house of the king of Judah say, Hear the word of he who is, O house of David, Thus says he who is. So here's a personal message to King Zedekiah from God through Jeremiah. Execute justice in the morning and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who's been robbed, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of your evil deeds. It's not just the fact that they are worshiping other gods and goddesses. That's, that's bad enough. The people, including the higher-ups in the administration, including the king himself, are cheating their fellow Jews. And God's call through Jeremiah is repent. Remember what repentance is all about. It's the change the way you think, which will change the way you act. So King Zedekiah needs to quit allowing people to get away with unjust activities and oppression and robbery. And if he won't do that, if he won't repent, then that's why the wrath is coming. Verse 13, Behold, I am against you, O inhabitant of the valley, O rock of the plain, declares he who is, you who say, Who shall come down against us, or who shall enter our habitations? Uh, This is, uh, again, it's a reference to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem, it actually sits on a hill, but it's also in a valley between hills. Uh, It is like a rock sticking up from the plain. And so God pictures Jerusalem having this self-centered, braggadocious attitude. Who can take us down? Who's going to take over our place? Nobody. We're too strong. Verse 14, I will punish you according to the fruit of your deeds, declares he who is. I will kindle a fire in her forest and it shall devour all that is around her. Uh, So this is, um, this is a, a going back again to the idea that trees often represent nations uh, and mountains that have trees on them are are the nations and the trees are the people. And so God's bringing the fire of judgment, going to take the forest down, 
because of their sinfulness. At this point, we're going to stay in Jeremiah, but we have to jump over to a different chapter. Chapter number 34, please. Jeremiah chapter 34. And this is happening, again, while the siege is going on. The word that came to Jeremiah from he who is, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army, and all the kingdoms of the earth under his dominion, and all the peoples were fighting against Jerusalem and all its cities. So that's, that's the chronology that ties it in with the area that we're at right now. Verse 2, thus says he who is the God of Israel, go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and say to him, thus says he who is, Behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. Sound familiar? We just read that in an earlier part of the book of Jeremiah. Verse 3, You shall not escape from his hand, but shall surely be captured and delivered into his hand. So this is a message from God through Jeremiah to King Zedekiah. You, sir, are going to be captured. You shall see the king of Babylon eye to eye and speak with him face to face, and you shall go to Babylon. Yet hear the word of he who is, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says he who is concerning you, you shall not die by the sword. You shall die in peace. So he's going to die as an older man up in Babylon, not in war, not because of all the bad stuff of war, but just because he's older. And as spices were burned for your fathers, the former kings who were before you, so people shall burn spices for you and lament for you, saying, Alas, Lord, alas, my master, for I have spoken the word, declares he who is. So Zedekiah is told, you're going to die an old man? Not here. Up in Babylon. And people will have a nice funeral for you. Verse 6. Then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words to Zedekiah king of Judah uh, in Jerusalem when the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left. left. Lachish and Azica. Uh, these are fortified cities to the southwest of Jerusalem. Uh, I was at Azica. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, standing up on the heights, uh, looking over the Elah Valley, uh, talking about uh, the uh, fight between uh, David and Goliath. Uh, these cities were also under attack by the elements of the Babylonian army. He continues, for these were the only fortified cities of Judah that remained. So they were the last ones on the list of the Babylonian invasion. Verse 8, the word that came to Jeremiah from he who is after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to make a proclamation of liberty to them, that everyone should set free his Hebrew slaves, male and female, so that no one should enslave a Jew, his brother. And they obeyed, and all the officials and all the people who had entered into the covenant that everyone would set free his slave, his male and female, so that they would not be enslaved again. They obeyed and set them free. Now, verses 8 through 10 are a flashback. They're setting the stage for what's coming up next. The year before the siege started, that is, in the fall of 591, that was the beginning of the 118th sabbatical year of the Jewish nation. Now, what's significant about that? Well, you remember that God set it up that they would work six days and take off a seventh. They also had this program where they would work six years and take off a seventh. That was the sabbatical year. In that sabbatical year, anyone who was in debt to other Israelis, had those debts forgiven. And since servitude, that is slavery, was often the result of deep indebtedness, 
all the indebted slaves were supposed to be released in the sabbatical year. So what we're told here in verses 8 through 11, uh, 8 through 10, is that in that year, they did it. Zedekiah followed the commandment of God through Jeremiah to honor the rule of the sabbatical year and all debts were uh, written off and all indebted slaves were released. But now that the siege has started and things are getting tight and things are getting rough, this is what happened. Verse 11. But afterward, they turned around and took back the male and female slaves they had set free and brought them into subjection as slaves. So they reneged, they went back on their compliance with the word of the Lord. And they sought out the people that owed them money and put them back into slavery again. Now, this is Jews we're talking about. Fellow Jews are now back into slavery to their Jewish masters. And God is not having that. God is not happy. And so, verse 12, the word of he who is came to Jeremiah from uh, he who is. Thus says he who is the God of Israel. I myself made a covenant with your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying, At the end of seven years, each of you shall set free the fellow Hebrew who's been sold to you and has served you six years. You must set him free from your service. So this goes back to the Mosaic law. No Israeli can be held indebted servitude for more than six years. That's the maximum. They're all supposed to be released from that indebtedness as the sabbatical year begins. Continuing, but your fathers did not listen to me or incline their ears to me. You recently repented and did what was right in my eyes by proclaiming liberty, each to his neighbor, and you made a covenant before me in the house that is called by my name. So apparently there was a big ceremony in that sabbatical year, uh, just a year ago now from what we're looking at, uh, when Zedekiah and all the other Israelis released their Israeli slaves. And now God says, that was the right thing to do, but... Then, verse 16, you turned around and profaned my name when each of you took back his male and female slaves whom you'd set free according to their desire. And you uh, bought, brought them into subjection to be your slaves. Therefore, thus says he who is, you have not obeyed me. By proclaiming liberty, every one to his brother and to his neighbor. And behold, I proclaim to you, uh, proclaim to you liberty to the sword. So God takes this and twists it around to tie it in with his judgment. I'm going to make you free to the sword, to pestilence, and to famine, declares he who is. I will make you a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth and the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, I will make them uh, like the calf that they cut in two and passed between its parts. The officials of Judah, the officials of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. Uh, we need to explain this. In the ceremony of making a special covenant. You would take sacrificial animals and uh, make your promises with those animals, and then uh, you would cut those animals up in half uh, as a sign of this is what needs to be done to me if I don't keep my promise. And you would uh, separate those animals apart uh, with a kind of a bloody path between them, and then you'd walk through this path of blood with whoever you were making your promises to. 
And so God is saying, how dare you guys that walked the bloody path of a promise not keep it? How dare you use my name, my house, my ceremonies, and then go back on it? Verse number 20. I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives. Their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. So God holds them to the details of their promise. May God do so and more unto me if I don't keep my promise. And so God says, fine, you're all going to die and your bodies are going to be scavenged because you didn't keep the promise you made. Verse 21, and Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his officials, I will give into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives, into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, which has withdrawn from you. Uh, Behold, I will command, declares he who is, and will bring them back to this city, and they will fight uh, against it and burn it with fire. I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. Now, we have not yet explained this idea that the Babylonians are taking a little breather from the siege whenever this happens. Um, It's related to us in chapter number 37, uh, if you'll go there next. Uh, Chapter 37, uh, verse number 3. King Zedekiah sent Jehuchel son of Shalemiah, and Zephaniah, the priest, the son of Messiah, to Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Please pray for us to he who is our God. Now, Jeremiah was still going in and coming out among the people, for he had not yet been put in prison. So, the writer of this part of the book of Jeremiah is like already saying, yeah, this part of the story happened before Jeremiah ended up uh, being uh, kept under lock and key by the Zedekiah administration. And it's also related to this, verse 5. The army of Pharaoh had come out of Egypt, and when the Chaldeans who were besieging Jerusalem heard news about them, they withdrew from Jerusalem. Uh, So it's hard for us to pull all this stuff together at the exact same moment. But what's happening is here in apparently the spring of 589, uh, the, the new pharaoh of Egypt, a guy by the name of Apries, uh, let me see if I can spell it for you, A-P-R-I-E-S is uh, the anglicized version of that. Sometimes he's referred to as Hafra. This brand new pharaoh has decided that he's not going to have those Babylonians coming down near his borders and taken over territories right near him. So he goes out to attack the Babylonians. And the Babylonians see this as a very serious threat. And so they take all but a keeping force of their military down to meet uh, the arriving army of Pharaoh. And that's when this next story occurs. Uh, Verse number six. Then the word of, uh, then the word of he who is came to Jeremiah the prophet. Thus says he who is God of Israel, thus shall you say to the king of Judah who sent you to me to inquire of me, behold, Pharaoh's army that came to help you is about to return to Egypt to its own land. The Chaldeans shall come back and fight against this city. They shall capture it and burn it with fire. Thus says he who is, do not deceive yourselves, saying the Chaldeans will surely go away from us, for they will not go away. For even if you should defeat the whole army of Chaldeans who are fighting against you, and there remained of them only wounded men, every man in his tent, they would rise up and burn this city with fire. So God's warning through Jeremiah is, don't you get your hopes up about this Pharaoh coming to save you, because he's not. He's going to be turning his tail between his legs and heading back to uh, the Nile very soon. And then 
the Babylonians will be back here and they will slam their siege right back on top of you again. And if you think that the uh, Babylonians are going to get beat so bad that they can't continue the fight against you, you're wrong. Even if there's only a few wounded Babylonians left, they're going to get up from their sick beds in their tents and they're still going to set this place on fire because that's the judgment of God. And then this happens. Verse 11, now when the Chaldean army had withdrawn from Jerusalem at the approach of Pharaoh's army, Jeremiah set out from Jerusalem to go to the land of Benjamin to receive his portion there among the people. Uh, what's happened is he's inherited some land. Some land has been deeded over to him. I think he actually paid a little bit of money to redeem it. Uh, but he needs to go and make the evaluations necessary to secure it. So he takes this lull in the Babylonian siege as an opportunity to go and take care of this family business. It's just a few miles uh, from uh, Jerusalem's northern gate up to Anathoth, where this is happening. Now, when he was at the Benjamin gate, a sentry there named Iria, the son of Shaliah, uh, Shalemiah, son of Hananiah, seized Jeremiah the prophet, saying, you're deserting to the Chaldeans. So this military guy that's on guard duty sees Jeremiah and says, you're defecting, aren't you? And he arrests him. Jeremiah said, it's a lie. I'm not deserting to the Chaldeans. But Iria would not listen to him and seized Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. So Jeremiah is being arrested in the spring of 589 B.C. The officials were enraged at Jeremiah because they're believing this lie, this falsehood, that he was defecting to the Babylonian army. And so they beat him and they imprisoned him in the house of Jonathan the secretary, for it had been made a prison. And Jeremiah had come to the dungeon cells and remained there many days. So Jeremiah is now in custody. He's been badly beaten and he will spend the rest of the siege in Babylonian custody. When we come back tomorrow, I will share with you how these facts do not allow for us accepting a legend that is quite prominent amongst Jewish people.